wonderful good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's really, really nice to see that so many of you have actually managed uh, the traffic here in Brussels and have come to the auditorium to partake in this discussion. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I said it yesterday, and I think I will say it again. By the way, my name is Connie. Surname is so complicated. Uh, you may want to have hear it once, Schumach, but uh, then you forget about it. Um, yesterday, I already said that whilst in Dubai, people are negotiating and getting very frustrated right at the moment. I think here we have the movers and shakers who will at least bring about solutions in one aspect that is part of the bigger solutions uh, on climate action. Now, Europe has been a front runner in the area of the bioeconomy, a pioneer, as it's being called, uh, of the circular bio-based economy. And uh, actually, that dates back, and I'm not quite sure, one of, or two of you may still remember, it was in 2005 that uh, the commission started, that there was a paper out there. Um, then there was uh, the first uh, bio-based industries joint undertaking since 2014. And now, of course, uh, we are in the next phase, always uh, related to Horizon, um, to the Horizon programs uh, of the EU. And I think we're also at a critical phase because, of course, next year there are the European elections. We may have a new commission. So it is probably about time to put down the most important points that we need to discuss. And um, of course, ladies and gentlemen, there is a new EU biotech and biomanufacturing initiative also coming up, designed originally for the first quarter of uh, next year. Let's see whether it's going to happen then. Uh, we keep our fingers crossed. Uh, Hans Ingels, uh, one of the panelists who is in the know, is already sort of nodding heftily. Uh, we're going to have a lively discussion later on. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we are at a critical time and we're going to be discussing something that is slightly similar to yesterday, but of course, it could stand on its own as a discussion point. Uh, we're starting off with a view from one of the big players in the market, Cargill, of course. Uh, and uh, I read somewhere Cargill is named uh, as one of the 50 hottest company in the bioeconomy in uh, 2023. Um, but I think that was US-based. So of course, we won't mention it. But hot sounds good. And uh, we're going to be hearing from Cargill's managing director for food solutions, meat and dairy alternatives, Belgian Kurzer. And uh, she will share not just her company's recent journey towards bio based production and what's needed to go even faster in scaling up the greener industrial process, but the lady who is now going to represent her company here has been in the industry for a couple of years. Uh, I'm not going to mention it, because uh, otherwise everybody would have said you started in kindergarten. And uh, uh, you have two absolute passions. One is, of course, uh, for what you're doing in your job. And the other one is, and I'm not even quite sure which is the most difficult one, to actually live it at home and uh, sort of cook and, and run a household for people with different tastes. Uh, so welcome to the club and uh, uh, welcome to the stage. And could you please, uh, this is sort of the rule of the game, always give the speakers a big applause before they come up on stage. Belgian. Thank you, Connie, for these warm words. Good morning, everyone. I am one of the happy few who managed to beat the traffic in Brussels this morning. So super proud to be here on stage. Um, and equally thrilled to be here among all of you in you know, such a diverse room of stakeholders and parties interested in how we could shape the bioeconomy world in the future. And I also would like to thank the European Commission and the Circular Bio-Based Economy Joint Undertaking for inviting me to speak today on such an important topic for our industry. And we know what we talk about because this is what Cargill does every single day. This is circularity and this is agriculture food systems as a force for good. Many of you would know Cargill as one of the world's largest agriculture trading firms. 
And now I should add also one of the hottest 50 companies in my economy. I love that. Uh, and this is indeed one aspect of who we are. But when you know that Cargill's ultimate purpose is nourishing the world in a safe, responsible, and sustainable way, we understand better some of the choices that we have been making over the last 158 years of existence. And in that context, we currently operate across a very diverse portfolio of food, feed, and industrial markets where we try to valorize the way every component, component of the agricultural raw materials that are used in our solutions for our customers. And together with our customers, we're also working to support resilient agriculture food systems and at the same time address some urgent challenges, including food security, climate change, biodiversity, and soil health, and more. And the beauty in circular bioeconomy is that it holds many of the answers to these challenges. And with my presence here today, I really wish to add voice to raise the sense of urgency to act and allow the circular bioeconomy activities to contribute with greater impact. So allow me to share a few illustrations of why Cargill, by nature, is already a central component of the bioeconomy. Our long-standing experience has taught us a few of these critical factors which are essential to further develop the circular bioeconomy in Europe. Obviously, the bioeconomy starts with farmers. Then, innovation drives the sustainability of agriculture food systems over generations. And last but not least, collaboration is the foundation for successful transformation of value chains. And let me take you through a few examples to illustrate what I mean here. We said, first, bioeconomy starts with the farmers. At Cargill, we believe that agriculture, with a capital A, is how we can mitigate climate change, regenerate soil, and improve water use while nourishing the world in a more sustainable way. And not only does agriculture feed our growing population, but we also know that when agriculture is done responsibly, it can capture carbon, it can lead to better environmental outcomes. And our commitment to sustaining our most important natural resources is anchored where the food system begins, and that is at the farm. So our vision to make regenerative agriculture a commonplace across our entire global supply chain by helping the farmers to produce food more sustainably and yet increase their profitability and resiliency. So last year in Cargill, we have launched the Cargill Regen Connect program in Europe. And that was really on the basis of very strong encouragements we have witnessed in North America. The Cargill Regen Connect program helps farmers improve soil health by promoting these regenerative agriculture practices and provide them as well an inclusive uh, market access that will, as such, help them build resilient and thriving agricultural communities. So working alongside the farmers ensures that the agricultural materials that we are processing for the production of bio-based solutions are sustainably grown and sourced across the supply chain. As you may know, most of our ingredients are the essential building blocks of the European circular bioeconomy, and they contribute as well to the competitiveness of European rural areas. So we said farmers, that's where it starts. But second, the sustainability of agriculture food systems are also supported by continuous innovation. So innovation, super important. And at Cargill, we don't only innovate around Regen Ag, or we don't only innovate around our own operations in order to meet our science-based targets for climate tar uh, or land use. We also innovate in terms of bringing to market innovative solutions that support sustainable development across the value chain. And here I have a few examples, which may come as taken for granted, but somebody had to make that first step and bold step to make it possible. When one of our confectionery customers approached Cargill for a solution for leftovers from producing snack bars, 
Cargill innovators stepped in, and they turned that side stream from the customer into nutritious feeding regions for livestock. So this is a simple example of circularity, where something that could have meant to become waste from food has become a virtuous feed to nourish livestock. Another example is Cargill that, ha that is offering methane reduction for livestock farmers. We have developed a natural and nutritional formulation that lowers the enteric methane production up to 10%. And it, while we do that, we also maintain the milk production and the performance in the rumen. So innovation there plays also a critical role as to how we rethink the way we feed and nourish and actually uh, create better outcomes for the society and the world. And the final example is how we innovate by using the power of bio-based products. And there it will be the paper and packaging uh, applications, where we manage to increase the content of recycled fibers uh, without compromising on the attributes of lightweight yet sturdy packaging that we all would like to have you know, in our Amazon deliveries or pizza boxes. So these are just a few snapshots of how innovation can foster circularity in value chains. So alongside the farmer and the innovator, there's actually a third hero that is shaping the agri-food value chain, and that is the collaborator. No one single actor can on its own bring the needed transformation. The transition will only happen through collaboration and partnerships, and between large and small industry players, as well as public and private sector stakeholders. And I think this room today is a very nice representation of this broader collaboration opportunity we have. And here I will want to speak to a successful project which you might have heard as well yesterday, which is very close to my heart. And I'm sure that many of the partners are actually here today in the room as well. Let me call out Plenitude, which is one of the CBEJU flagship projects today, and, and that is really bringing that whole concept of collaboration to life. To give you com com some context there, while Cargill is active in animal protein, we also have a long-standing uh, history of supplying plant proteins. And we do so from our biorefineries processing starch and vegetable oils. And the public and private collaboration that comes through Plenitude has actually opened a totally new avenue for protein diversification, not only for ourselves, but also for our consortium partners. As we all know, consumers are increasingly adopting a holistic approach to nutrition, health, as well as wellness. <clears throat> and they are seeking to make healthy choices that are equally aligned with their growing interest into sustainability, as well as their willingness to minimize their footprint on climate or natural resources and biodiversity. And the plant and alternative proteins overall address these concerns, which is also one of the reasons why we see an increase in popularity in the recent years. Also, we need to mention the uh, European Farm to Fork strategy and the global movement around more sustainable foods that are setting the perfect scene for this transition and the development of the plant-based and alternative proteins to build a resilient food system, not only in Europe, but equally beyond, with the peace of mind of food security. I will continue that this is exactly the aim of the Plenitude Partnership. When we talk about Plenitude, we basically talk about 10 partners who work together towards building the first of its kind value chain for sustainable protein using an integrated biorefinery setup and leveraging the power of collaboration. And here's how that three-pronged approach is delivering value. On the one hand, Cargill's starch biorefinery in Saas van Gent in the Netherlands is supplying feedstock to feed the fermentation process of Enough's abundant microprotein. And the two factories are really operating through a fully integrated setup uh, by making optimal use of energy and natural resources. On the other hand, the project partners are coming together to make the mycoprotein a novel ingredient used in various applications, ranging from food, such as meat and dairy alternatives, to pet food, equally into bioplastics, so you can name it. 
And it is really thanks to the long-term financial support through CBE, the public funding that CBE is offering, that this production process and the application work we are the partners can be advanced and scaled to bring to market such a broad variety of alternatives to traditional protein. So I've been arguing now in the last 10 minutes that the foundational growth for a circular and bio-based economy lays with the right focus on farmers, on innovation and collaboration. However, there is one <laughs> additional factor and that is having the economics work out for the investors, for the industry players, as well as for the consumers. And let's face it, deploying a circular bioeconomy in Europe is capital intensive, and hence it requires significant investments from both public and private sources. And in addition to that, scaling up innovation also requires an enabling policy framework, which also provides efficient permitting, and at the same time, also supports through a deliberate incentive package that ensures that the European industries and assets remain competitive on global stage. And I will therefore close with a call out towards our policymakers to adopt a balanced approach when it comes to economic realities, growth ambitions, and sustainability objectives, while providing the needed support to intentionally shift industries toward bio-based production. Let me thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the panel discussion with my peers and any possible question you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Belgian. That was uh, absolutely fascinating and it laid the ground for a number of questions already. May I ask you or invite you to join uh, the panel? I think uh, it's uh, the seat last uh, from the end. And with that, I'd like to, whoop, um, I'd like to bring up everybody who's on the panel right now, and I will be introducing them the second they're up here. Okay, <laughs> Dirk, <laughs> um, Sarah, Juliette, um, and Belgian, and Hans. Perfect. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now that they're sitting, um, and now that we've heard the bumper, I heard it, you, have you heard the bumper? <laughs> yes, please, thank you. <laughs> um, Let's just uh, have a very quick round of introductions. I think uh, in this context, maybe the gentleman to my right does not need introduction, but still, uh, I'd like to do the honors. Uh, Dirk Keres is uh, executive director of BIC, the Bio-Based Industry Consortium, and so the other half in uh, the JU, uh, JU uh, the joint undertaking, and we will be hearing from you in that role mostly. Sarah, Sarah Hoskins is biosourcing platform leader of Unilever and I'll be addressing you first because we'd like to hear the um, view of the big companies because we're talking about industries and uh, um, then um, uh, we have uh, Juliette. Juliette has two hats. I'll be referring to your first hat right now uh, as deputy managing director Starch Europe. So uh, you not only represent big companies, but also smaller ones, smaller ones, uh, SMEs, uh, so we'll be talking about that in the first round. And last but not least, uh, a man with uh, um, a weight on all shoulders, of uh, course on one side, on one hand, he is negotiating partners with the industry, with consumers, I'm quite sure as well, um, and of course in this round representing the whole of the EU, uh, but uh, right at the moment, yeah, actually working as head of unit for bioeconomy chemicals and cosmetics in DG Grow. And um, we know that there are many DGs uh, in, uh, in Brussels um, and maybe 
there is also a plethora of voices and therefore actions, but we'll be getting uh, to that in a moment. So, ladies and gentlemen, rules of the game are we're going to have a couple of uh, Slido questions. I think uh, you still know how that works because uh, those of you who have been here yesterday, this is uh, just the QR code. Not for now. We'll be talking uh, with you, but we'll do a very brief round here on the panel, maybe a round and a half. And then we'd really like to get into conversation with you. And there are two uh, gentlemen and a lady who will be bringing the microphone to you so that you can actually interact. So if you have a question, please put it down or just simply remember it um, as we used to. Um, Sarah, I said uh, you're working for another big wig. Um, and I think there's probably hardly anybody in this room who's not ever used um, any of the products of Unilever. And this is, this is uh, not exaggeration this is probably a statement of fact um, um, for some of the uh, cleaning stuff uh, and the materials um, you just can't but um, use some of your products now of course um, let me take the position of the consumer we are incredibly happy um, if it's the companies who are doing uh, what we want them to do and develop issues and products that we can then use with a clean conscience. Um, I mean, that's certainly for me. Uh, and I'm quite sure, having listened to what consumers are saying yesterday, um, it seems to be something like two thirds of consumers in the EU would like to do that. Now, that's the wish. Uh, it's still hard work. So A, how do you do that? And um, uh, what is sort of the perspective? Um, and, and I'm sure that you go different pathways to Cargill, uh, but what are you doing? Okay, so just a little bit of uh, intro um, and response to uh, some of your points first before I address the specifics. So Unile the Unilever purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. <coughs> So that means we're not targeting those green consumers that want to buy sustainable products specifically. But if you buy a Unilever product in the future, when we meet our goals, um, you will be buying the sustainable products by default. So we are targeting all our consumers with sustainability, be that through bio-based products or other renewable strategies. Um, and we do have very ambitious sustainability goals. Um, for example, achieving net zero across our scopes by 2039. That's pretty ambitious. And there's a lot more besides that. Biobased products, of course, have a huge role to play in meeting these targets. I'm gonna zoom in on our home care products, and that's because we have some particular challenges there in meeting our goals. We, in that business group, we are heavily reliant on fossil-derived surfactants. And when we started this journey 15 years ago, 90% of our home care ingredients were fossil-based. And now we want to get to zero. Okay, by 2030. Um, now, those fossil-derived surfactants are incredibly cheap. They're effective, they work really well in cleaning your homes, your clothes, and they, we use them in huge volume. So we've got that tripartite challenge of cost, performance, and indeed scale to tackle. Now, how the hell do we tackle those sorts of problems? So two, two main strategies, drop in replacements uh, using renew renewable carbon, including bio-based wherever we can, but that's not always possible. Then secondly, novel ingredients, bio-based ingredients. Um, now that, as we were talking about yesterday, involves a lot of regulation, time to get through that process, and inevitably, a higher cost point. Um, our approach on that is for novel ingredients, we must have new functionality as well that we can offer our consumers so that we can make those claims and deliver a real reason for them buying and just perhaps we can accommodate an extra element of cost in our products that we deliver to market. <coughs> I'll give you one example. Um, 
And that's the example of um, a biosurfactant we call ramnolipid. This is a surfactant that is made naturally by a bacterium, but it wasn't readily accessible to us because the bug that produces it is a pathogenic organism, not great for use in manufacturing. And then secondly, it was also produced at much too low a yield to be commercially viable. We partnered with one of our suppliers, Ivonic, uh, who had independently been exploring this biosurfactant um, ingredient, their product, our ingredient. And we came up with a solution. They did their clever synthetic um, biology engineering of, of a, a non-pathogenic organism to make the RAM the lipid at high productivity. Um, we'd now, we, through our in knowledge of our consumers, we put this into various consumer testing programs, and we identified that there was a real plus point, functionality, new functionality, unlike when you do the washing up normally, so it, this was a hand dishwash product, when you expect your hands to feel dry and you need to go and put your moisturizer on your hands, our consumers are spontaneously saying, this is fantastic, my, my skin feels brilliant. So a real selling point. And when we did a trial launch in South America, because it's easier to get through the regulatory framework there, um, it flew off the shelves. And that gave us the incentive to go to, to scale up with, with Ivonic. And that's where we are there. I mentioned drop-in replacements. So I'll give you a second, um, just briefly, example there. So I mentioned our surfactants are a big challenge and replacing the petrochemical hydrocarbon chains that are used. So I'll give the example of a collaboration we have with Genomatica. Big US, again, synthetic biology engineering company. Um, and we've partnered with them on R&D to deliver bio-based hydrocarbon chains to make our surfactants. Um, reasons we, we went with Genomatica, we did explore European companies as well, um, are essentially their technical readiness, but also <laughs> their R&D bandwidth. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, we will do a quick second round and uh, how you achieve all that and that it's a question of, uh, as Belgian said, cooperation. Uh, we'll be addressing uh, in a moment. Uh, Juliette, uh, um, Deputy Managing Director, Starch Europe, um, you have a lot of uh, different companies in your association, um, more than 30 uh, starch producing companies, but a hell of a lot of farmers behind that. Um, and uh, the, the question that um, I, I would have to you is, there are a lot of smaller producers. Now, the term bio, bioeconomy and bio-based production is, of course, something that in bigger companies, um, no problem. You just sort of, you know, create a new department. You make sure that the new department actually talks to the old departments and that they sort of align, even though I'm quite sure, uh, Sarah and uh, um, Belgian, that's not all that easy. But what about the smaller uh, companies? Um, do they have to go either or? or um, that, that must be a problem, a challenge. Yes, thank you, Goni, for, uh, for this uh, very valid question. I think I would like to put the context of uh, my association. So indeed, I represent uh, the European starch industry at large. So it's, it's more than 95% of the starch and plant protein production in the EU. Uh, we have a number of companies that range across uh, larger members like Cargill, but we also have small and medium-sized enterprises. Some of them are indeed set up in, in, in cooperatives with farmers uh, sitting on their board. So a wide variety of members in Starch Europe. And uh, I would start my plea today, if I may, with recognizing what we have in Europe today. So for CBEJU, I think it's, it's really key to see that we have in Starch Europe uh, 70 plus starch and plant protein biorefineries, um, all anchored in rural areas across 20 member states. So it's important for us to say this because the small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as the larger 
uh, corporations, they, they are often in rural areas, they are often the sole or at least the main employer. So it's, it's a matter of contributing in, in income, but also in employment in rural areas, which is key to many other policies like the common agricultural policy for, for farming. Um, the reason I'm saying this is also because of this wide diversity in the membership, we have a wide diversity of offer. So we do produce from the 25 million tons of agricultural raw materials that we buy almost exclusively in Europe, we produce a wide portfolio of ingredients, starch-based, protein-based, and all these ingredients, as Belgian said, uh, they go to either food or feed or industrial and at the very last energy applications, which enables us to be near zero waste. Because we have this wide variety of bioeconomy outlets, we can always do something with our materials. So that's, for me, the beauty of the bioeconomy. Um, to your question on the SMEs, because we, we do have this wide range of ingredients, we have um, a history of continuous innovation in our industry, we have also um, long-standing cooperatives who have uh, a history of uh, connections with their farmers. I would say that what we hear, at least from the CBEG, is probably mostly a, um, a lack of knowledge of the program, probably uh, the complexity of the rules for applying. These are two stumbling blocks, I would say. But the, um, the small and medium-sized companies I talk to basically say that most of the time they don't have so much time or money to devote and dedicate to um, applying for calls. And I think the last thing is also the list of topics that need to be very relevant to them. So that's my second plea today is if CBAG you could make this list um, available I would say upfront for people like us who have to disseminate across the EU and across all our board members uh, companies, then that would that would help us target the right um, the right topics and the right research and innovation actions priorities. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Um, I'd like to bring next in uh, Dirk, but uh, before I actually put the question to you, give me uh, that one second, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for you to get out your mobile phones if you haven't already got them out. And uh, we'd like to see once more the QR code for the Slido. Um, which I can already see, and now you can uh, pick it up. Um, as opposed to yesterday when I asked very open questions to you, I'd like um, you to answer the first question, the first slider question, which is going to sort of give you a multiple choice, uh, and you have time to do that. Um, so even when you can't see it anymore, you can continue voting um, whilst we're listening uh, to Dirk. Of course, um, we would all like that uh, bio-based products are speedily introduced into the market. We'd like them uh, to be there yesterday rather than tomorrow. Uh, but what needs to be done? Thank you very much for working alongside uh, Dirk. Um, and uh, as I said before, you are the important partner uh, in uh, CBEJU. Um, JU. And uh, as the Biobased Industries Consortium, uh, you have a, a, an important part to play. Um, let's uh, stick for a moment with inside EU issues. We're, we're going to be having the look outside in a moment. Um, some speakers uh, mentioned yesterday that EU policy is somewhat confused or contradictory. Um, and um, it's, it's a question of what do you actually do for the circular bio-based um, industries? Um, the, the voicing is nice um, and, and uh, positive, um, yet there are stumbling stones on the ground. Uh, you must hear that quite a bit. Um, what's your take on that? Thank you. Well, you know, we have around 260 members, companies from all kinds of industrial sectors, from agriculture, food and, and forestry, pulp and paper, chemical industry, aquatic, uh, but also brand owners. And indeed, uh, bringing these different sectors together, we see clear, uh, a clear voice of, 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 of what is needed also to accelerate the benefits. 
Uh, and if you want to keep these benefits in Europe, as you mentioned, and what are these benefits? Well, I think the upscaling innovation, as we have seen here outside, uh, we see that we can create new markets, we can create new products, we can create new applications, we can reduce the dependency of uh, fossil uh, fuels or resources, we can enhance strategic autonomy, we can create, by the way, new investments and new jobs, uh, we can make industry greener, and we can help to tackle climate change in Europe. But indeed, what we have seen is that this doesn't happen by itself. Um, we need some support so it happens and so it could happen faster. And we could have a big, bigger impact. And I want to mention indeed three uh, elements as a start. We hear that some companies have, have already this uh, vision, uh, but we really want to defossilize, I would say, uh, our industry in Europe. Defossilize means the use of virgin fossil fuels. If you want to have an impact on climate change, by the way, if you want to be more autonomous, so we have big opportunities there. And that means that we have to use, increase the use of biomass, bio-waste, CO2, by the way, as a feedstock, um, but also the use of recycled, bio-based and non-bio-based uh, materials. And, and there we see already two several concrete actions. Uh, for instance, today, only 16% of the bio-waste uh, is collected. So this is a huge uh, opportunity. One, one six? Just well, of the food waste, one six. Uh, so this is huge. Uh, okay, some countries are a bit more advanced than others. Uh, I think we have a report on our website. But there's a huge opportunity to collect and to use this as a feedstock. Uh, and by the way, also the collection of um, uh, bio-based and fossil-based uh, materials that can be used again as a feedstock is also important. So we have to keep the carbon in the loop, so um, collecting it better so that we have additional feedstock, I would say, for the to defossilize, I call it, uh, not decarbonize because it's, we always need carbon. Uh, this is an opportunity. Two, if we use bio-based, uh, and we heard it also uh, yesterday, I think we have to acknowledge, we have to incentivize the benefits of biogenic carbon. Uh, so we have to recognize that biogenic carbon, um, we have to recognize biogenic carbon in, let's say, carbon legislation, climate legislation. Renewable carbon in products and materials uh, should also be recognized as a solution to tackle climate change. Today we have renewable energy directive because we think, indeed, we have to do something uh, in our energy production uh, to tackle climate change. But I think we also need something like the Renewable Materials Directive so that also the carbon, renewable carbon that we capture in products is recognized uh, as uh, one step in the good direction. And then my third element is, if a company, if you are a company and you want to invest in Europe, well, you need a market, you need a feedstock, and you need access to finance. And, and we see that, indeed, there are some regulatory hurdles, uh, sometimes collateral damage of uh, legislation, which is needed, but has, it has an impact. So consistency in legislation and policies is important, checking also the possible impact on different sectors. So, so a better coordination of policies, regulations, I think this is also something that came out of the discussions yesterday. But we also heard from, from SMEs, uh, if you want to attract uh, an investor, um, you need to have a product that can be brought on the market. Uh, and the approval system, the approval uh, time and the, the cost of registration is quite costly, I have to say, it's quite high in, in Europe. Uh, and it's going, it's going much faster in other parts of the world, and this is also hindering investors sometimes to invest in European SMEs. Because you need a return on investment at a certain moment. And then last, I think we have to support uh, upscaling and, and like we are doing with, with the CBE, but that's not enough, we need more. Because SMEs have difficulties to find support to do their upscaling, to do a demo, to go to proof of concept, because if they go to a proof of concept, to a demo, and it's positive, of course, it's easier to attract investment. So more support, public support also for upscaling, proof of concept, uh, demo is, I think, important also to boost investments in Europe.
Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we're almost done with the first round, but Hans, before I bring you in, let's have a quick look at uh, uh, the weighting that you gave uh, to the four aspects um, that uh, I had suggested. And let's have a look at the outcome of the slider question. So um, I think uh, greater harmonization, uh, as we've already heard yesterday, and I'm not quite sure whether each and every one of you was there yesterday. So um, that was a theme that had already been talked about, uh, is a big uh, question. And uh, I think, Hans, that might be a sort of uh, something that I'd like to bounce off you. Uh, more support for SMEs, yes. Um, thank you also, Dirk. Uh, for uh, putting the finger on maybe not a wound, but on an issue. Uh, increase in research and development and better financial support for companies. And by the way, the finance uh, it does not play such an important part here today in our discussion, simply because we do have uh, different tracks uh, that are exclusively dealing with financial uh, access. Now, I said uh, um, you have, uh, Hans, a lot of, sort of <laughs> weight uh, on your shoulders. Uh, Hans Ingels, uh, um, but uh, um, the, the, the big question is, the EU does a lot uh, to support bioeconomy. I mean, you know, let's take that as a basis. And maybe you'd like to sort of share with us how much it's, it's actually done. And of course, you come from DG Grow, which means um, you're, you must be on the side of, of industries. Um, but this question of um, the dichotomy between some DGs and others is just out there, and we've seen it reflected here. Please uh, take it away and uh, take your time, like four minutes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you very much, Connie. I think I would need a full hour. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Olga. So, uh, uh, there's no dichotomy between DGs um, because I think that we. Uh, most of the EU officials spend 20% of their time on coordination with other colleagues. Um, and perhaps it's good to take a few steps back. Uh, as a policymaker, what we try to do is solve societal problems, is, uh, which might be climate change, which might be pollution, which might be waste, which might be a single market problem, which might be a health problem. So uh, this, this is our task, this is our job. For doing so, we've got mainly three instruments. We've got financing, we've got coordination, where we put people together and try to solve a problem through charter or through standards or through any other uh, informal means, uh, or we've got rules. And sometimes you need rules to enforce certain things or to, put, or to force people to change behavior. And this might be consumers, but mainly it is very often businesses, because you want to create a level playing field, you want to create a single market. And this is where we come from, because we all work in terms of objectives. Um, and I see that uh, recently, uh, and, and, and we all support this, um, there's the EU Green Deal, because we're all facing this major problem of climate change. We're facing this major environmental problem. Uh, but we're also facing another problem, uh, since the invasion in Ukraine, is the strate open strategic autonomy, because we very often depend too much on fossil sources from outside the EU. And this is a combination of factors. Um, so in our, all our discussions, um, we try to b bring in the bio-based element. And so um, we've heard a number of examples also yesterday in the panel about which is considered as being bad policy, um, for instance, single-use plastics or packaging and packaging waste. But we do have this, had the discussion. Huh? If I may, for instance, on packaging and packaging waste, because uh, yesterday I heard during a panel that uh, the EU got it wrong on bio-based. The objective of the, bio, of the pack, uh, packaging and packaging waste proposal, and where we were closely involved in it, is indeed to reduce waste and to ensure that packaging and packaging waste, that packaging uh, becomes more biodegradable, it becomes compostable, uh, recyclable. So in other words, the, the problem that there, that proposal in the EU wanted to solve is a problem of waste. In other words, so you need to also to address the packaging. We had long discussions with our colleagues in the environment on whether or not we should give some preference to bio-based. And then the 
difficulty that we had is to show somehow that bio-based is bio-based packaging is better than any other packaging to solve the problem of waste and then biodegradability, compostability, recyclability. And as you all know, and you may have seen it in the, also in the uh, bio-based plastics communication that we published last year, there are very few elements to show that bio-based is necessarily better than any other solution. Um, and we're now also discussing this with the European Parliament and Council to that because probably we'll have to make a specific report on bio-based plastics. Uh, and that will have to be done within a few years to see whether specific measures are needed to support bio-based plastics and what are the different elements are. So um, I do not necessarily agree on the dichotomy. What I do believe is that the main problem that we're having here, for, and, and Dick they already uh, said what I wanted to say, so thank you, Dick, for, um, um, for, for I, I will not repeat what you said. Um, but what we, the, the problem that we're all facing for Biobase is that somehow the narrative needs to be improved because we all need to show why Biobase is better than, for example, fossil-based. Mm. And this is um, the thing that we will, um, and, and, and this is the narrative that we'll have to improve for all of us, is that we have to show that uh, carbon from fossil sources is worse than uh, fossil from, 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 from biogenic sources or from CO2, from recycling. Mm. Um, and uh, also that um, there is the issue of open strategic autonomy, which is very important. Because we, if we all continue, um, and, uh, if we all continue uh, producing based on, on, on fossil sources, at some point this will end. At some point somebody might decide uh, to cut this, and at some point, this uh, we're simply exploiting uh, the planet. So, in other words, if you want to come to a circular economy, bio-based will um, have, a, have, have a major role to play. But then we all have to clarify our narrative: why is bio-based better than something else? Thank you very much. Um, with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, I'd do a quick round and I would like to pick up one point on the production side, uh, i.e. how we get at uh, products uh, to, go to products and then really say, you know, uh, how viable is uh, the European approach in comparison uh, to, let me say, the competition uh, or co-creators in uh, the world market, uh, the US and China. Uh, Sarah, uh, let me start off with you. Um, uh, we've heard from Belgium again that uh, you need cooperation. And there's, there's a word that um, I remember from the car industry, and I don't know if you remember that, like 20 years ago, uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, getting hybrid cars, there was actually a consortium of all kinds of car makers together as, as co-opetition, uh, but they got the basics right. And then, of course, they all sold their own products. Um, how much is that actually happening? in your market, and then where are the advantages of cooperation, like for example, with the company that we've heard from yesterday, um, just in a brief uh, tick off. Sure, yes. So there are times when we definitely don't want to cooperate, and let's uh, start with that one, where we, ha we need proprietary IP for competitive edge. And the Ram the Lippis example I gave is exactly that, yeah. Um, but there are other times when absolutely it makes sense that we share the investment, the regulatory burden with our competitors. And a good example there actually is the Genomatica um, relationship that we have, um, making hydro with the ambition to make hydrocarbons from um, bio-based sources rather than fossil carbon. Um, there we are working absolutely with our competitors and there's two competitors in the co-investment um, joint venture cow who are an asian competitors in the household care home care i should say space and l'oreal so yeah we absolutely do do it where it's appropriate um, as i say hydrocarbons are dropping replacements and we don't see that it's it really is that beneficial to us to go it alone there's much more to be gained from it, from doing it together Another example that I'll give, um, where, which has actually just been announced in, in the press last month, 
is in the ice cream business, uh, where we announced that we were going to share 12 patents on ice cream formulation, which seems bonkers from face value. But actually, when you dig beneath it, those um, ice cream formulations are all about how to stabilize the ice cream products at warmer temperatures. And the challenge, of course, is if we can raise the temperature in store at which they need to be, well, frozen, <laughs> um, you can save an awful lot of greenhouse gas. 10% of our value chain greenhouse gas footprint comes from in-store freezing. Um, and by making those patents available, um, we can encourage the whole industry, actually, to raise their storage temperature from minus 18 to minus 12, which will get, say, 25% of in-store greenhouse gas footprint associated with those products. And the motivation there is actually storage temperature in-store is not a competitive point for us, yeah? Mm. And actually, there's a logistical one as well, because the stores don't want to have two different freezers. They want to just have the one at the warmer temperature. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I'll leave it there. No, I, I think that's very nice uh, to, of you to actually take us into the details because uh, with a complex situation like that, it, it um, then sort of opens up the heart, even if you're from the industry, uh, for uh, the issues that you have to face, uh, even if the direction is uh, in the right way. Um, now, uh, Belgian, uh, you were actually sort of saying that uh, we have to come to a new understanding. Um, you were actually sort of uh, coming out uh, with a strong statement uh, at the end uh, of your uh, keynote. Um, could you sort of expand on that a tiny little bit? Sure. Um, for those of you who are you know, living in Belgium, yesterday was Saint-Nicolas, Sinterklaas. Yep. <laughs> I don't want to sound Hans as I'm coming with my wish list for Sinterklaas. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's, I just would like to maybe, yeah, put two points forward as maybe trigger for thinking. When we look at the European ecosystem, um, we see a lot of innovation that gets generated in Europe. You know, we have lots of brains and talents and a lot of you know, collaboration to bring it to demo pilot scale. Very often what we see is when you have to take it to full scale, industrial scale, we are basically dwarfed by you know, our cross-Atlantic uh, competitors. And actually we also see now new emerging uh, uh, hubs like the Gulf region, where clearly there is an appetite to attract new technology, not you know, edge, uh, novel edge uh, investments. So I think it's something for us as a broader industry and ecosystem to really reflect upon. You know, how do we actually capture the full value of the innovation that we have triggered and generated in Europe, and also make sure that that IP potentially thrives in Europe and to the greater benefit of the world? I think that's one question. I think the other one is really about the um, regulatory framework. And I think both Sarah and Dirk, you touched upon that. You know, when you have to bring novel ingredients to the world, the European landscape today is somewhat fragmented and the approval process is somewhat lengthy when compared to, you mentioned Latin America, even North America, and let alone, we are even don't speak of Singapore. So how do we make sure Europe remains at the forefront while still you know, preserving the consumer interest, while still producing food safe solutions or environmental safe solutions, but yet how do we connect the different parts of our regulatory and overall European policies so that everybody moves in the same direction? I think these are the two elements that collectively we probably need to make a step change and I would really welcome you know, that we all reflect upon that. Thank you very much. Uh, Hans, uh, you, you had a sort of uh, look at each other just now. Do you, do you want to respond quickly um, on, on the question? No, I tend to agree with what Bergen said. And I would like to have a Christmas or a Seneca a wish list. Because this is what we need to know as policymakers. And because I think that most of our policies, not all our policies, have very noble objectives. But they do sometimes cause collateral damage on certain sectors and uh, impacts. Because with all policies, you create winners and you create losers. Uh, 
And so the objective is, and the objective of a good policy is that you create, that you, by your policy, you support or you create many winners and very few losers. And if the losers, um, if they are losers, they should not ideally not be uh, in the EU. So uh, that it's, it's true that we still, still have, a, uh, have some way to go. I'm not entirely sure that investing in the Middle East will rely a lot on biomass. Uh, that this is something that you need to explain to me. Okay. Um, but okay. I, I open, think you're going to have a coffee later arguments. on together. So, yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> but thank you very much also for, for, for saying that there is sort of uh, this joint effort, quite obviously, and, uh, and a great understanding. Um, I have this one quick slide of question in between, and uh, I may have sort of uh, uh, left the height of the wave uh, already, but it was more or less about uh, small and medium sized companies. So, uh, uh, if you were to be so kind as to uh, have a quick look at the question, the next slider question, um, we need to strengthen the role of small and medium-sized companies. I know that in the overall situation, we were at uh, around about 20% uh, there, but um, it, it's still worthwhile looking at it. And it's just yay or nay, and again, um, uh, we, can, we can do that after the next person. Now, um, you were writing along like hell. Um, is there anything that you want to have as a direct uh, response, or are we already transitioning to, and you have your, it's your choice, uh, to sort of, you know, Europe as the home base? And of course, you know, when we talk about bioeconomy and, and we have to have the, the agricultural side, we have to have the farmers, therefore, you know, whatever is happening in the US or whatever is happening in China is, is not much of a consequence because we need our farmers here and, and the producing uh, production here. So, um, is that what you want to? So I think it's on? a bit of both, Koeni. Um I would say first, in Europe, we've always been visionary. We've always been pioneers with all our bio refineries. We've always catered for all the outlets of the bio economy. That's one thing, and I'd like to respond to uh, to Marc Lemaitre yesterday, who called us uh, an innovative. Yes. Infant industry, I wouldn't say we're such infants, because if I'm honest with you, uh, the starch industry dates back to, or starch uses, date back to the Egyptians. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, times of the pharaohs, uh, they used starch to strengthen their papyrus, and then they could uh, document the use of starches in food and non-food applications in their papyrus. We also find uh, starch in um, personal care creams, thousands of years ago, so I would say not so infant. Uh, innovative on the one side, we, we are driven by constant innovation, but on the other side, we also have an awful lot of existing traditional bio-based ingredients and products that worked very well in, in our cardboard and, and paper um, segments that was mentioned by Belgian. If I take the statistics of my own association, I mean 40% of our sales go to non-food applications and 30% of them to the cardboard, glues and, and paper. So in Europe, we have already an awful lot to offer to our customers and to meet uh, um, demanding consumer expectations. We heard yesterday we have the right uh, type of consumers here. Uh, but on the other hand, I would say we need more in terms of uh, standardization. I think uh, we're grateful to uh, DJ Grow to, to take the lead in this. And, and I think um, w the proof is in the pudding. We have this study of the Nordic countries, which uh, states that uh, the increase in GGP, GDP in these Nordic countries was down to, what is it, 28% to standardization. So let's get Europe to lead the way, because we, we can see that in terms of um, standardization, notably in the international standardization organization, it's the countries with the deepest pockets who are funding uh, the standards on bio-based, namely, you name them, China and the US, and to close the loop with our US counterparts. Um, I think what we need here is market creation measures. Without proof to concept, indeed, you have no investors, but without a market, you don't have any return on investments. That's true for all types of companies. Um, we have 
watched the development of the USDA Bio Preferred Program since 2015 in the US. Uh, we quote this numerously to our commission official interlocutors. Um, it's, it's very simple. The program says public procurers are required by law to buy bio-based because of a dozen benefits that are listed, less toxic, renewable, this and that, climate friendly. An awful lot of our European ingredients are doing very well in the US bio-preferred programs. We have the innovation. Um, why can't we do this here in Europe? We have a legislation on green public procurement. Why can't we have like a criterion for renewability that would be enshrined in the green public procurement? This would give, you know, you talked about industrial scale. This would bring our innovation to industrial scale. We would create a market. So. That's my response. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, on the way to getting you into the discussion and your uh, questions, and uh, it's, it always seems to happen before I address you, Dirk, um, uh, I just wanted to say both of you, um, of course, have a, um, um, you, you, Juliette, have a second hat. Uh, um, the organization that you've created is uh, EUBA, uh, and you've actually done a bioeconomy blueprint and um, this uh, sort of takes me to Dirk because you uh, have actually sort of uh, last, uh, at the end of last week uh, together uh, been involved uh, in a discussion and that's when we now come to the, the point uh, we are not alone as Europe. Of course, we have our internal issues, uh, but um, the Biden administration has uh, introduced an advanced biotechnology and biomanufacturing executive order, um, which is quite nice. Um, how many of your members do you fear are now sort of thinking, uh, well, you know, we keep one foot in Europe and uh, put de definitely our toe uh, into the US, because uh, it's a bit more sexy. Now, I mean, um, uh, the, the funny question, but um, the uh, real uh, answer, is that a worry? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the long answer is, yeah. why is it a worry? <laughs> I think we also have to look back a bit. If you are a company and you want to invest, you are looking, where should I invest? And as I said, there are several aspects. Where is my feedstock and where is my market? And then there are some other aspects. If I look a bit to the past and where we were in, in Europe, in the past, you know, you had Brazil. This was a sugarcane based, I would say, bioeconomy, mainly making bioethanol. Uh, in the US, it was a corn-based bioeconomy because there was a lot of corn available, making especially also ethanol, but then also bulk plastics in the beginning because there was a lot of feedstock available. And in Europe, we were more focusing on all kinds of feedstock, you know, how to use also bio-waste and so on, uh, which made it more difficult. But I have to say today, this is an advantage because we invested a lot in research and innovation to use all these kind of feedstocks. So that's, at this moment, is an advantage technologically uh, wise. If you look to markets, of course, in the States, as mentioned, market has been stimulated by, by a preferred program, by uh, giving uh, a logo to BioBase. It was visible. You knew what was a bioplastic. Uh, in Europe, you didn't know, is this a bioplastic or we just had a discussion or another plastic. So this is important. Uh, the market was stimulated in, 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 in other parts of the world. Um, if you look to I would say, uh, programs we had. Uh, at a certain moment, 10 years ago, we were funding a lot of research, but companies were going to the United States because you had programs to stimulate the development of demo projects. Uh, so the deployment was happening elsewhere. After a lot of discussion, we have set up this partnership. And as you can see outside, we could keep this kind of, um, you know, from technology to almost production, we could keep it in Europe and Finally, we could attract companies from outside of Europe to come to Europe because they liked to participate in this model of setting up value chains. So we have no companies also in our organization from the States, from Brazil, from Japan, by the way, that would like to invest in Europe because this was an advantage. Okay, there are also some other problems that we discussed, but the world was, is not standing still. Uh, China, India, Canada, but you know, also the US, and indeed the Biden administration has published last year the executive order on biotech and biomanufacturing with 
and that's also important, not just you know, a roadmap or a nice document, but with a budget of two billion, that's important, <laughs> so that it can be implemented. Immediately afterwards, they started already you know, to stimulate some projects. We had a, a webinar, I think, last week with our friends from the United States. We heard already that a few months later, they developed that vision with clear targets. You know, what do we want to achieve within five years? And what should we do? And how much money have to, do we have to put in? So it's a very clear, very concrete action plan with targets and with money. On top of that, they also have the Inflation Reduction Act saying extra billions to invest in greener technologies. So this is really attracting now many companies to invest in Europe because it's going fast. That's also important. And I know that China is doing the same. So we are not alone anymore. We had, a, I would say, a like kind of a competitive advantage. But at the moment, there's really a danger, indeed, that companies are also looking to other parts of the world um, for several reasons. Eh? So, um, yeah, we should not uh, sit down and just stand still. We certainly also have to, to, to make progress uh, in the future. But that's why we have hands. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have fans, as I said, uh, uh, boat on already. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Sophie and Matthew are having a uh, microphone. And uh, could you please, I'm sorry, uh, raise your arms. Um, that's the old fashioned technology that we're still using. There's a gentleman, uh, oh, Sophie there. And uh, Matthew, could you just move over to the uh, second person? We, I'd like to collect three statements right at the beginning, and then we'll uh, reverberate that uh, on the panel. Sir, could you get up and just quickly share who you are? Yes, hello. My, nom my name is Martin Klemesche. I work for Brascom, a uh, Brazilian petrochemical company that also makes bio-based plastics. Uh, to you, Hans, uh, you mentioned we need a better narrative for bio-based uh, to prove we're better. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Because Europe already has mandates for biofuels that are our feedstock to make bio-based plastics. So why do we need a better narrative? I think many companies here have LCAs of their products and they can prove their products are better. So I would like to listen a bit more on that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, Hans will remember, um, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, um, my name is Markus Hochuk. I'm from the University of Graz, researching on bio-based products. And my question is, yesterday we talked about a lot about that bio-based products are better, bio-based products are wanted by your customers, but especially maybe with Unilever, what is the price sensitivity of your customers, the end customer, onto the bio-based solution? Because you specifically said that you need a value added, so additional functionality for your new bio-based products. And I'm really curious about that one. Uh, uh, I assume that's to Sarah and to um, Belgian. Thank you, yes. and of course, probably uh, uh, by agglomeration uh, to Dirk. Any more questions in this round? We would be able to take one more. Uh, no, thank you. So, Hans, very direct question. Yeah, I'm just talking about my own experience here <coughs> because um, I do believe that at the moment, in certain areas, um, and certainly to policy makers, but also to consumers, there's still a problem of demonstrating why bio-based products are better than fossil-based products. Because for instance, for policy makers, this is not always clear how this could contribute, for instance, to the reduction of packaging waste, for instance, to the reduction of the waste of plastics in the environment, mm. for instance, in other different areas. Um, so there the narrative needs to be improved in general, but also towards consumers. Um, and I've had the experience uh, also recently with uh, friends of mine and also with my family, is where you, uh, um, that you have somehow have to explain them why are bio-based products more sustainable? Why are they better? If you have to make a choice as a consumer, why would you like to, why would you buy a bio-based product? And why would you pay the extra price? And I think the most important sentence uh, that I've heard this morning it came from Belgium. Is we have to get the economics right because the bio-based products are more expensive. So somehow you need an extra narrative. Either we correct somewhere the economics in the value chain this is, this is a possibility where uh, somehow this is corrected to policy measures or you correct it at sales where you say um, the products that 
are more expensive. They are more because they're bio-based, and you know that, that we all know that bio-based products are a bit more expensive because the production is more expensive than, than relying only on fossil-based. Is that somehow this, we correct this by giving a kind of preference, and then you could go into a bio-preferred option, uh, a bio-preferred program because it's only about procurement, um, and then we could elaborate an entire morning on, 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 on this. And, but there's also consumers. You have to convince consumers that this is better. And this is not so obvious. Um, this may be obvious for you, but my personal experience is that it required a bit um, that you have to explain to people why a more sustainable option, which is more expensive, is worth paying for. Uh, and I do believe that in general, and, uh, and what I see around uh, and, and talking to different people, is that there are still, we in the bioeconomy, we still have some way to go. Thank you very much. I know that Juliet needs I'd to, like to chip say in. one sentence. <laughs> one sentence uh, to contribute to the gentleman um, of Brescam's question. In one sentence, I think it relates also to your communication on biodegradable, bio-based and compostable plastics. At Start Europe, we have been pioneers in, in leading um, life cycle assessment studies. We did our first one in 1998, so last century, and we've updated it three times since then with new figures on agriculture, because obviously this is the, um, one of the hot spots. We have contributed to the joint center uh, John Research Center study with Mr. Rana Pant. We have shared our own um, product fact sheet, you know, to, um, as feedstock for bio-based plastics. And uh, we were very disappointed with the results because the result is we don't take account of biogenic carbon. So if you only add on all the greenhouse gas emissions without deducting the biogenic carbon, the result is just not great. And I think this is really a deep methodological issue that needs to be solved in GRC. Thank you very much. Uh, quick choreography, uh, Sarah, Belgian, and Dirk. Um, so I'll, I'll chip in just slightly on that last question, if, if I might, first of all, before I go on to the second question that was asked. So we have some amazing demonstrations already of bio-based products that have been around for decades, actually. The detergent enzyme industry, which is huge in Europe, you know, and we ought to sing about that a lot more. Um, and, and in this case, it's not a straight LCA comparison. It is the fact that if you put, if, as we do, we use detergent enzymes so we can take those fossil based surfactants out of our products. Yeah. So there's lots to bear in mind there. Um, second question was on. Um, functionality versus price sensitivity, et cetera. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a basic um, premise here that the fossil industry has been around for decades. The ingredients that we are buying historically are at a very, uh, uh, produced on a huge scale. Scale means cheap, generally. And also, um, the, they are very cheap from a, an ingredient fuel, feedstock perspective as well. It's difficult for bio-based products to compete with that from a feedstock price perspective, but also from a maturity of the technology that is used for the conversions. So, we, and sustainability, unfortunately, doesn't usually carry a premium in terms of price. And we have to deal with that somehow. And the, the tool that we have is that functionality which equals claims with our consumers. And it's claims that we can advertise, use for advertising and marketing purposes. And, and the, that's where our marketeers are very clever and they know exactly what our consumers are prepared to pay for those additional benefits, that functionality. Thank you very much, Belgian. Yeah, and I will maybe just add to Sarah's example. Um, we are all consumers here in the room. So let's forget, you know, that we stand in for bioeconomy, but as consumers, certain things we're willing to pay a premium, but if it has to become mainstream in your weekly purchasing basket, we also want to make sure that it is at the right value. And ri value doesn't always mean cheap, right? But it is the right value. So ultimately, as consumers, 
we would want even the bio-based solutions to be at parity with the previous reference. So sooner or later, you know, we know that becomes a major hurdle to basically gain the volume in the marketplace and increase the penetration of the solution with consumers. So as that is the most important postulate, you need to work it backwards. And you know, my business and my company steps one step behind Sarah's business. And very often, you know, as partners, you turn to us and say, hey, how can we solve this? Mm. And very often we say, we can solve it, but this will require, you know, $300 million investment <laughs> in an asset to produce that particular <laughs> component. And by the way, what is the volume? Oh, maybe 100 metric ton in the first two years? Oh, we have a problem. So I think this is where, again, as an ecosystem, we really need to rethink how we are rewarding innovation and step changes towards the bio-based economy. And more used to be the former paradigm. You produce more, you get more incentive. Maybe circular <laughs> could be the new more. <laughs> so how do we reward innovation? How do we make sure that some of the funding that we were putting in other places you know, in the economy is redirected to speed up that kind of activity and adoption? I think this is going to be really important because otherwise it remains anecdotal innovation and we'll never be able to make that leap. As long as we don't want to do business as usual, we have to change and uh, we do not start with the economies of scale, we start smaller. Um, Dirk, from, from your, let me say, Eagle's point of view, uh, is there a solution? <laughs> oh. Maybe if, if I look at the moment, you know, I think 88% of the materials and products produced today are uh, produced by fossil fuels and only 8% bio-based and I think half percent CO2 at the moment. So that means that if today you develop, you invest in research and innovation and you develop a new product, bio-based product, uh, you have invested a lot in research and innovation and registration and approval. You have to produce it, you have to invest in a production uh, facility. So you bring that product on the market um, and you have to compete already with products that are produced for, for ages, I have to say. So you come with a product on the market which is more expensive. And this is quite difficult. It's David against Goliath in the beginning. Because the more you can sell, the more you can produce, the cheaper the product can be. So, but the problem is the market introduction. If you develop your market at a higher price, this is difficult. So I think some solutions to facilitate the access, the introduction in the market until you have reached a certain volume, this could already help. Um, and then I would say the second element, if I see to consumers, um, my kids, well, especially my, my daughter, <laughs> um, you know, they are more aware of sustainability. Eh? They want to pay a little bit, not a lot, a little bit more if uh, they can shoes which are made by vegan, vegan leather or uh, if they see that this is a bio-based or recycled uh, product. So this certainly helps. So, uh, I, so that helping them to identify these products on the market uh, can certainly uh, also help. So there are, there are certainly some some measures uh, that, that, that can uh, support us. But by the way, if you say we have to communicate better the advantages of bio-based against fossil fuels, we're also talking about, okay, that's in the area of sustainability, functionalities, but we also talk about autonomy. We want to be more autonomous. The fact that we use uh, locally produced feedstock instead of importing fossil fuels is already an advantage. Uh, the fact that we can uh, produce a bio-based product instead of using f uh, virgin fossil fuels is already also an advantage. And this should also be taken into account. And this is sometimes also forgotten, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Hans, if you want to react, you can, but uh, you don't have to. I uh, would love to give the audience a chance uh, to put their questions to us. Um, there is a gentleman in the first row that I see, and maybe um, there's a gentleman exactly in the middle. Uh, so, um, Sophie, would you mind going to the middle? Uh, perfect, sir. Okay, I, I can start then. Hi, I'm Peter. I work with uh, Neste Renewable Polymers and Chemicals. So, first of all, I, I think we need to address this idea that bio-based is too expensive. You know, the real problem is maybe that fossil is too cheap. And if we look at the costs of global climate change, it's 
something like 176 trillion dollars by 2050 that it's going to cost us. So if we did internalize that into the price of um, fossil, I think maybe the picture and situation would look slightly different. But I also want to commend what the EU is doing because I know Hans has a lot of good colleagues that are in Dubai these days working to secure maybe a phase out of fossil fuels in the future, right? So I guess my question is, you know, what is the EU's plan B? And maybe to all the panelists, do you see this more as an industrial policy that we need or more consumer facing policies? Because we already talked about packaging and yes, that's 40% of plastic. But ultimately, we're, we're all the way at the end of the pipe, if you'd like. So what is the EU's plan? And do you see in the panel, like, this is a need for a whole new industrial strategy we need here? Thank you very much uh, for that question. And uh, there is another gentleman who already has a microphone. Um, uh, due to the fact that um, the light is better when you stand up, do you think you could give us the pleasure of standing up? Thank you. <coughs> Yes, good morning. My name is Stephen Webb from a, um, RTDS in Vienna. We, um, my question is kind of to Cargill and, and also to Steve, Unilever. a bit closer. My question is to Cargill and to Unilever. I mean, obviously you produce product and that's what you want to do. You want to have product which is uh, uh, sort of bio-based and sustainable. But the packaging side always kind of leads to me a little bit left out. And, and there are, of course we want to have recyclable packaging. That's for sure. But if we don't have a recycling system in place, and there's a many places around the world where there is no efficient recycling, collection recycling system for packaging. So the alternative is to have packaging which actually degrades and degrades quicker and doesn't have any harmful residues in the environment. So this is kind of a um, double edged sword. You know, so we're in Europe, Yahoo, we've got collection systems and recycling and it's PET is great, we can do it, you know? But there's many, many places in the world where it's just not viable. And so what's, what's the deal on that? And, and of course you export around the world and on the packaging side of the hands for the policy, is there any kind of um, approach for that as well? How do we, because sometimes recycling is just not an option. Thank you very much uh, for also the uh, second question. Maybe uh, Dirk and Hans could uh, answer the, the first, and then, of course, uh, uh, Sarah and Belgian were specifically addressed, and Juliet, you can talk to anything. <laughs> so on the, the consumer policy and, and, and industrial policy, um, I would say they go hand in hand. Uh, so we were talking about coherence of policies. So I don't think you need only an industrial policy if uh, there is no market. So you also need a consumer uh, policy and vice versa. So really to you know, uh, obtain this kind of more coherent policies and so on, I think you really need the two. They go hand in hand. And that's very important. Thank you very much, Hans. Yeah. Uh, I never said that the bio-based products are too expensive. I said they're more expensive usually than fossil-based. Uh, but this is clearly part of a uh, future industrial policy, yeah? uh, because um, the, the, and, and this, is, this is what you see and it's being discussed at the European Council, at Prime Minister level, this is a, uh, an issue of competitiveness, and it's competitiveness of the European industry. And we're looking at it from a supply side, uh, because this is how you create a single market, is you actually try to um, have fair rules for the entire value chain so that the consumers ha have a fair choice, an honest choice, and a safe choice. And this is how we're looking at it. So we're looking at the supply chain level, but we do, we are aware that, that there's, a, there's a price difference somehow. And if we don't address the price difference somewhere in the value chain, um, there will still be reluctance um, uh, with some consumers to uh, opt for bio-based. Uh, and if I make a comparison, because I'm always, um, uh, I'm more than 30 years in the commission now, I've always been observing from a distance, for instance, the rules on uh, organic farming. 
And now, for instance, you see labor on organic farming, and this is a very powerful instrument, I believe, to convince consumers. And what I see with my children, with my family, whenever they see you know, a, a label organic farming on, on, the, on the product, they tend to buy it because they know it's better. You know, it's more expensive. It's more expensive than that, but they, they, you feel that somehow this price difference is addressed to, for instance, is, uh, or, uh, the, the label on, uh, on, on, uh, on bio on uh, organic farm. We could envisage something similar, for instance, for bio-based products, but then in segmented areas, eh, because then you need to discuss for also with the detergents industry, is there an added value of this label with respect to eco-label? Or do we, do we need something different? And then you know, same thing for cosmetics or for, 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 for other areas. So this is a discussion that we, we, we all have to, or that we should be, be doing during, I think, the next, next two years. Eh? Because the, the, um, we'll be publishing a biotech and biomanufacturing initiative. And I expect this also one of the, one of the questions that we need to address in the, not in the medium term, but I do believe this is a short term question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Juliette, you're sort of in between all, yeah. so. Uh. So thank you, Hans, for um, quoting the uh, biotech and biomanufacturing uh, initiative uh, launched by uh, President von der Leyen. This will be indeed the core of our work. And thank you for this very pointed question, gentlemen, because I think we should use what works here in CBEJU. So that's coordination and collaboration. Coordination between policymakers and collaboration across all value chains, as you just mentioned. If I take my sector, for instance, I would say all policies matter, from you know, the common agricultural policy, where you have eco-schemes that can indeed uh, encourage sustainable agricultural practices, throughout the whole chain. I mean, we coordinate with every single DG. We coordinate with you, but we also coordinate with the, the transition pathway for the agricultural sector. Uh, you colleagues, we coordinate with JRC on LCAs, we coordinate with DG Agri on uh, the plant protein strategy where we say it should, be, it should not be a standalone strategy, it should be part of plant proteins are part of the bioeconomy, it should be under the umbrella overarching of the bioeconomy strategy. Same for uh, sustainable food systems where they focus on food but they don't take the non-food uses into account which means this is the, the, that's what enables us to be zero waste. So it all needs to be coordinated. Hence my plea for, and that's uh, supported by Euro the European Bioeconomy Alliance, my plea for a commissioner dedicated to mainstreaming the bioeconomy in Europe in the next commission mandate. Perfect. Uh, Belgian and Sarah, and then I'd like to have a very brief last round. Wh whoever. Okay, I'll, go, I'll jump in first then. Um, so we're talking about packaging and the uh, dichotomy of recycling versus um, composting or biodegradation. Um, I think what you need to understand is that packaging is an incredibly technically challenging area. Yeah. Um, certainly for our types of products, we need, we're looking for long shelf life, we're looking for high moisture barriers, and we're looking for packaging that can cope with really quite aggressive to packaging um, components. Plastics do that, re fit that bill really well. Yeah, that's the, I'm, I'm unashamedly saying that. So we are on the recycling side there. Um, but we are, of course, working in this space with our competitors. Yeah, let's come back to a former theme, earlier theme. Um, and in consortiums where they are trying to push the needle on what the bio-based technologies can do for packaging. Um, it becomes even more difficult when you think about the recycling or indeed the composting option that you have to have the whole composition that will go down one route or another. And if you're going into recycling, it's got to cope with the existing recycling frameworks. So in short, it's not simple. There is a huge challenge. We are working on it, but it is, and we have ambitious targets in those areas. Um, but it is not simple to get to the um, quality of packaging that we need. Um, and we would desperately want to do more. Yeah, and Sarah, I would just add to what you shared now. My, in my previous life, I was also leading our European industrial starters business mainly aiming at you know, 
grow the packaging and clearly <laughs> the transition to bioplastics was also in our, in our line of sight. Um, I would put a question forward again. Sometimes by trying to make these leaves and transitions, we may try to create a five-legged sheep because we want the packaging to be recyclable, compostable, biodegradable. I think there's been a lot of effort in the industry, across the industries, to prove that we can often achieve two of the three, but the three at the same time is almost mission impossible. So I'm just wondering whether, you know, we should maybe reconsider what is going to be the first big step in the direction to full biodegradability, but maybe we need to take two steps first that we really make sure it's there, and then we can rethink the whole system of recycling, do we need to add extra processing in the recycling steps and not so much in the packaging design and components? I think there is a bigger reflection to be had, but we have some learnings we can certainly leverage as to what could be possible and what is mission impossible. I think to come back also to the question to our um, um, uh, yeah, question from Nestle, um, you know, to your point, is maybe you know, the um, petrochemical based components too cheap versus the bio-based alternative. I would concur to that reflection as well, because in my space today, meat and dairy alternatives, and Cargill is a traditional meat company as well, right? Mm -hmm. But when we look globally, the subsidy and the public funding that goes into traditional meat and traditional dairy, it is 2,000 times more than what the alternative space is capturing today. So as long as we don't change these kinds of paradigms, it's going to be very challenging to reach some price parities or value thresholds that would also work for the consumer. We now have uh, another Mission Impossible. Um, we have four minutes left. Um, uh, I still want to share with you the one answer that you gave. Uh, so maybe uh, we can see the result of the Slido uh, question of much earlier about the SMEs, but I think that is so uh, obvious uh, that it's, uh, um, uh, well, I, uh, nobody actually needs to say anything about it, but <laughs> Hans sh uh, shrugs his shoulder. Yeah, yeah, what's to be expected? So, with three minutes left, means that each and one of one of you can really only say one sentence, but it's the one sentence that everybody should remember when they go to work or to their job tomorrow. So, uh, <laughs> what should we, oh, Hans, you, you just sort of uh, grab your microphone. What should we remember tomorrow morning from this discussion? The one thing. That we should be proud in Europe. But uh, I will make a very long sentence. <laughs> yeah. First of all, we should be proud in Europe because in the bioeconomy, especially for research and innovation in Europe, we're world class. Um, and the, here, the bioeconomy, especially the, 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 the different actors in the bioeconomy, are world class. We should be proud of ourselves. And I hear a lot of comparisons with the, with the US, or still the same sentence. Uh, we, I hear a lot of comparisons with the US. Uh, but we're doing great, um, and we compare, for instance, the, uh, the bold goals that the U.S. published in March. Uh, you make up because this is a consequence of the executive order of uh, President Biden on the bioeconomy. So they published these bold goals on biotech and biomanufacturing based on, I think there were 10 goals and uh, four teams. And there, if you compare it with the U.S., we're doing great uh, because we're, st we're, we're, we're ahead of the U.S. in a number of things. But we're not good at other things. Um, we're not good because we're fragmented somehow. What we're doing as EU, we're doing it in a very fragmented way. We have a lot of financing, but we have it in uh, dozens of programs. We have organized our single market. We've done it in dozens of rules. Still one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, we can do better, but we're already doing, as an EU economy, as an EU single market, uh, we can be, be proud of ourselves. And this is not commission, to be, but it's, proud, it's a common effort. And so we should be proud of Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, that means for everybody else to really stick to one sentence without a comma. <laughs>
<laughs> Juliette, can you do that? Oh, yes. Um, so I agree, we should be proud and build on what we have today. So that's fantastic industrial fabric and ample agricultural biomass to integrate and accelerate market creation measures. And for this, I took with me something we worked on 15 years ago, and which is still, oh, where is it? <laughs> Many Very, papers there. It was okay, there. How about if you sort it and you, and you show it as I'm the last thing? So, uh, Sarah, the one, the one sentence everybody should remember. Okay. So, um, I was asked to, to talk about large companies and their role in bringing bio-based products to market. I hope I've shown that, yes, we have a huge role to play there. But please, if you're representing SMEs, uh, working with SMEs, don't forget that you are the source of innovation that we need as well. So, please talk to us. And we'll try and talk to you too. And, Belgian. I would just say, Let's just move faster and bolder towards a bioeconomy. 2030 is just tomorrow, right? We are at the eve of 2024. And if we want to bring new solutions to market with our regulatory framework, which takes on average four to five years for anything to be approved, it means if you have not come with your solutions for approval in the next 18 months, you miss the 20 hit marks. So let's be bolder. And it's not going to be one or two companies to get there. I think we really need to sit collectively, every actor of the value chain around the table, and rethink how we're going to get there within the time that is allotted, and how we can move the needle with maybe a few initiatives, but with the support and the financial means behind it. One sentence. OK. So I would say, let's keep Europe uh, the champion not only in research and innovation, but also in developing the markets. It's no comma, it's just continuing. And uh, also for the markets, and maybe one example to do with is via kind of renewable materials directive. So we have the renewable energies directive, but let's recognize the capture of carbon in materials uh, with some, to visualize it, uh, to create awareness and to give some incentives so that the entry in the market is cheaper and that the market is growing. Last but not least, Juliet shows something that yes, I want our to Taking biobase from promise to market. This is coming from UDG. We worked together on this in 2009. And we and can download it where? From the Commission's website. And uh, I would say, let's turn the many rules that we have in a positive and proactive manner to create markets. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've managed almost in time. Uh, thank you very much for giving us two minutes from your coffee break. Uh, and uh, we hope that the discussion with you was uh, fruitful uh, on your side, uh, even if it was confirming maybe your thoughts. Uh, and everybody here is still going to be around a couple of minutes. So if you want to come and have a one-on-one, -on -one, talk to them. But for everybody else, we're going to have a coffee break. We're going to start again at quarter past 10 with the next session. So do enjoy. And uh, I hope the stakeholder forum is really was it, what it is all about, dialogue and maybe shifting things. Thank you very much. <laughs> Big applause for the panel.